So shalom and welcome to dustdefeat.com because this is a place where we can safely explore the endless ways of God and the interconnection of his creation. Our belief understandings, they may be challenged. Divine misunderstandings, they may exist. And traditional teachings, they might falter as we pursue connection, context, and community with God and each other here in an environment of grace and love. So, feel free to journey around the space. Explore. We have many different topics for discussion. Outside the class, Sons of the Father, Bible Project, Aleph Beta, Follow the Red String, and more. Lend your ear, and then lend your voice. Join a conversation. Start a conversation. Ask questions, because you're probably around folks that just might be pondering the same thing. Community that can build and connect. So come in and join us. And welcome to The Dusty Feet. So good evening, and it's June 13th, 2023, and we're continuing our Matthew series with Tim Mackey with episode 35, Panic Attack. With this way of doing things, you can watch the video before we begin chatting. We hope to keep these to around 15 minutes or so. This one might be a little longer. Still, easy to catch and easier to catch up on. So, welcome to Outside the Class. In the description below are links to all of the audio, video, and source documents that we use here in the Dusty Feet. We want to make sure that any material we use here is properly credited to those folks who work so hard to bring it to us. Without their efforts, the learning we do here does not happen. And of course on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe and click that bell icon if you want to remind And as always, it is expected that you watch the reference videos first to get a context for this discussion and to hear the perspective of the originator, in this case, Tim Mackey. On the dustyfeet.com, the outside the class section, we have this entire Matthew series thus far. And always, each of the source videos for all of our discussions are posted there in advance. So, if you haven't yet, just pause this. Go to the dustyfeet.com, explore, and watch the video. When you come back, we can chat. And we're back. So I, again, I want to make it kind of clear as we begin that I'll be mentioning and discussing some points that will probably be very challenging for some. And again, I suspect that it'll divide the room at times. So my intent always is to share what I currently believe and understand about the kingdom of God, its concepts, both the narrow ones and the wide ones. Panic attack. Interesting. So, to start off, I found something that Tim brings up that, uh, that the story of the disciples have made it clear about their failures and shortcomings. So I want to put it out there for discussion. Donuts and coffee. Okay. But I want to bring up a perspective point that uh, maybe it's not realized enough. 
because we seem to like to emphasize, point out, often criticize the, the children of Israel in the Tanakh. We see their failures where they just didn't seem to get it. You know, and then, as Tim mentions, we see the same in the disciples. The Israelites, they're not only the chosen people of God, but they're also tasked with protecting and passing down through their generations the Torah and all the other scrolls. And then we see from Moses on down, all of the authors, they're, they're very open and honest about their failures and shortcomings. You know, because the scripture accounts are not by some disinterested third party, right? Just to capture for historical purposes the story of a group of people. It's almost biographical, right? And, and honest open and often brutal account of their lives from their perspective. There's, um, there's no attempt to hide, to dismiss, to cast blame on others. Um, it's from their hearts. And occasionally God's intervention and his revelation, that's where we get these stories. So the disciples are not new here. They're just the same folks. They're from the children of Israel. They're continuing the story. Again, with divine involvement at points, and the story is it's not new or it's not different. It's just a continuation. So because of that, I do take a little exception to this when Tim mentions that the, uh, the Christian religion is this way. Because I'll say that the entire history of those that follow the God of Israel are this way. But I do think, sadly, that the story is all too often seen that the, uh, the Christian religion, over the last, say, 1900 years or so, really, they seem more like the, uh, the political landscape that Tim talked about in the beginning of the episode. But like I often say here, I'm going to say it again, the story continues. So what is our contribution to the story? Yeah. Is our story one that would be seen, looking back, in the same pattern? The coffee and the donuts? Well, therefore, what might that mean for the way that we should act and live today? Hmm. Something to think about. Okay. So let's keep in context, right? Let's remember that in this point in the story, that we are at the end of the Last Supper, that uh, that last Passover meal we just had three episodes on, and Jesus is telling them that they'll they're all going to fall away, right? Are we any different? I think maybe more often than we care to admit, because we tend to see others as, um, at least I would not do that, or or I'd never do that. And I think the truth is, too often, for me, I've already done that. You, you just don't know. Remember, we like to go sandal wearing here, right? We need to see ourselves in these events. Because I think it's the humanist that connects us. The brutal truth as, as it plays out, yeah? You know, but we say, but at least our failures and shortcomings are not in a in a book for all to see for millenniums, right? You know, although right now with the internet helping, it kind of reduces that, I think, right? Because once it's out there, it's out there now. Yeah. So we see the response of Simon Peter, right? And um, do we see ourselves in the, uh, I would never do that too, right? Or um, because for me, for me, I can say, I've done that very thing. Let's see if I can clarify. Whenever we do anything that Jesus would not do, right, um, in private or in public, where we are doing that very thing, of course, we will politically minimize it. It 
really doesn't matter, or blame it on others, or worse yet, the devil made me do it. But it's the same thing. It's our today, every day. That's something to ponder. Okay. So we're in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the three that Jesus take with him into that inner garden, right? We have Simon, John, and James. Yeah. Simon Peter. We know who he becomes. He's the Simon Peter. Yeah. John, well, he'll go on to pen a few letters. But he's most known for he'll also be the recipient of the revelation, right? The the scroll that lets us know it's not all over yet. We're not home yet. And then we have James. He becomes the, the leader of the Jerusalem Council of 70, right? But it's this council that monitors, questions, and endorses Saul of Tarsus. That's the man who becomes Paul. So these three, messy start, for sure. But I'm going to go out on a limb and say, strong finishers. Okay, so again, in the garden, Tim makes the point that Jesus breaks. How did that first hit you, right? Jesus breaking. Hmm? Oh, I agree with Tim here. Jesus breaks down and he pleads with his father. I don't want to do this. If there's a way around this, please let it happen. Yet, if there's no other way, it's your will, my father, that I'll follow, that I'll obey. When he brought up the words that echoed from David, that Jesus is feeling the pain and the anguish that the king in the line of the lineage that he is from, he understands. In his humanness, he understands. I love the point that Tim brings up about the, uh, the Lord's Prayer, that this is Jesus' prayer. Because the Lord's Prayer is not some cute prayer that fills in the blank, right? In this example, this is the prayer that when life is at its lowest point, on that, I will stand. You know, our old English hallowing and thouing, right? Um, I think that too many times can distance us from text, scripture, but specifically this prayer. Um, but it's the example of Jesus that, I'd say all too often, hopefully, can help us grasp a bit more. So Jesus is in his most vulnerable humanness, scared of the impending events and of the pain no human should ever go through, much less inflict on someone. But he's seeking comfort, strength, and guidance from his Father, the only one who fully understands him, who understands the necessity and that loves him. You know, I really like the point that Tim makes up about the the necessity, the, the need to rescue us, right? But at the cost of not being rescued for him. You know, he says, I don't want to drink this cup. But literally, just a few hours ago, Jesus raised that third cup in the Passover meal, right? We covered this, the cup of redemption. This is my blood. But now, it's here. It was that moment. It's about to get real. It's time to be the cup. So think when you hear the do this as often as you do this every year in remembrance of me. Because it's that cup used as the cup of judgment with Elijah, right? That needed to happen. And the cup of redemption. That also needed to happen. You know, we really need to remember 
that even at this very moment, because we can't read backwards into the story, because these men that have surrounded Jesus for two to three years, right, they still have no idea what's coming. So how could Peter understand? He, he still believed that Jesus was going to be the conquering king. We had his, even with this rebuke in chapter 16, right? The, and the conversation that we had just a few hours earlier. That's what's in the front of Peter's mind. You know, it probably will not be until, until they all get together and look back. You know, maybe it was even at the Passover one year later. Maybe all of this came flooding back in their heads, yeah? You know, I like the, the term that Tim used, that dark night of the soul, where Jesus is finally here. His first prayer pleads. His second prayer accepts. And the third, this is the same thing. Maybe it's a, are you sure, Father? And maybe it's a, help me get through this. I'm going to share my personal thoughts here a bit. I am not of the school of thought that emotions are only for humans, right? That emotions show weakness and that they're flawed. I'm of the conviction and belief that they are integral to connection. They bind us. So for me, I cannot imagine the pain and hurt that the father's going through in this prayer with his son. The emotional agony that your beloved son and everything he's about to go through, right? Even with the understanding that it's necessary, right? Think of a parent that has a child that needs to have surgery. It's the will of the parents that the surgery needs to happen. It's not the will for the why. Neither is God's. The parents love their child, and they know the necessity, but that does not really mitigate the pain. You know, Tim talked about how um, when we go to Jesus, to our Messiah King, that when we're pleading our hearts and, um, and sometimes that indescribable pain, that he really does know. He really does understand that. And again, like Tim said, Jesus will be there right with us through all of that. You know, sometimes the irony I see is that we often plead to get, get out of the consequence that we have culpability in. It's, it's our own mess. And yet with Jesus, it's not his consequences, right? but the mass of humanity's consequences. You know, and the purpose is so that we could be reconciled to the one that we needed to be reconciled with all along, right? Since the garden, to be reconciled to the Father. You know, it's probably not lost on a few of you that uh, it's a man in a garden, again, with the Father. But this time, he's not running and hiding. He's doing this thing in humanity's place. He's telling God, do what you need to do because we need to reconcile this. Yeah? And then, enter Judas. You know, did it ever seem odd or off to you that Jesus, he's arguably the most wanted man in Jerusalem, again, for both good and not so good reasons. Um, and the group that was sent to, uh, to get Jesus, right? They're from the chief priests and the elders, right? So they knew who he was. And yet Judas needed to kiss him to point out who he was. The greeting, not out of place. It's very cultural. But the need, interesting thought. Okay, so in Matthew's account of this event, remember that he was not there for this moment. So um, 
some of the details that are not there that the other gospel accounts cover. I found it interesting, right, that uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't mention Peter in the action. John does. And neither Matthew, Mark, nor John mention the healing of the ear, the one that Peter cuts off. Only Luke does. You know, these are the kind of things that I find interesting and why I believe, and I mentioned it in part nine of the Bible Project series, How to View the Bible, that the four gospel accounts are necessary. It's like the Torah. All of the scrolls in their entirety tell the story we need to hear these 2,000 years later. You know, at the end, Tim asks a question. He says, who are we? I say these millenniums later, these followers of the Messiah King. So I'll make a delineation that Tim kind of makes since he coined a word that I use regularly, and that's churchanity. Because we, we are not church followers. Those that follow this Messiah King who are followers of Jesus. Sadly, I know of and have seen way too many church followers. Hence, probably why there are literally tens of thousands of denominations that float around on the planet today. You know that I'm a proponent of the Hebrew name of Jesus, Yeshua. Um, the baggage that comes with uh, all of the Greek terms and such, uh, that can make things even more messy. So I'm going to stick with this, that I'm a, a follower of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that yod heh vav -Hey, and his son, Yeshua. He's the suffering servant and Messiah King. I guess that makes it rather clear. It doesn't give me much wiggle room anyways. But I realize those initial followers of Jesus, they're not better. They're just chosen. And I'd all say we're not better. We're just chosen. Remember, the Father reveals the Son the Son, he points to the Father. So I'm just glad that I can begin to understand that and maybe live in it. So in our next study in our Matthew series, to we're going to cover episode 36. There's only one more after that with 37. Episode 36, the crocus flower and the empty tomb. Messiah as king. Okay. Here's our point to ponder. There's no picture here, just words. You know, we heard Jesus say, love your enemies. You know, that's often a very hard pill to swallow at times. You know, at this dark moment, as Jesus did so many times, he put his own words to the test. You know, one of Jesus' most staunch followers, at least headstrong anyways, believes so deeply that Jesus is supposed to be king now that he cuts off the ear of a slave. And like Tim mentions, do you think Simon was aiming for his ear? Or maybe it was to cut off his head. Not only does Jesus rebuke Simon, but he heals the ear of the very man who has come to arrest him. You know, in all the other healings, we would say that it is love at the core of each one. Is this one different? Or is Jesus doing what he did so often, show an example of something more. Jesus turns a potential murder-hate event into love. 
He lived loving his enemies. So I guess maybe being a follower can be a, a bit messy at times. Because sometimes we have to ask ourselves a question. Are we anywhere near there yet? And thanks for with us tonight on this episode of Outside the Class on the Dusty Feet. <laughs>